Peace family, welcome to another episode Underground Railroad Productions. This is your host, Brother Rich. Back in these Brooklyn streets with Blue Pill, Blue Pill, we giving the world a tour of Brooklyn this week. Uh, let me let me show. I gotta show the artists, you know, since we uh, at Educated Little Monsters. Little Monsters. Right, right, right. Right, and I got something else over here that says at V Valentine ninety nine. It must have been a collaborative work. All right. Say that name again. At V. Ballantine 99. So that's and we are on the corner of Broadway and Willoughby in the Bushwick area of Brooklyn, New York, a.k.a. Hipster Central. <laughs> yo, yo, I was just telling Blue, man, I, it don't even feel like Brooklyn, man. I didn't even realize this was Brooklyn, man. It's so it's so different out here, man. Different. But let's uh, let's get to the show, my brother. First of all, before we start, as always, I got to say... Thank you. Pull that up for me while I uh, give a shout out to the Patreon family. Everybody out there supporting Brother Rich and Underground Railroad Media, yes, Black again. Magic uh, on shout Patreon. Shout out to the patrons on Patreon. Peace, shout out to everybody on PayPal supporting. Shout out to everybody that downloaded the KTL app. All of this is important to ensure that independent media keeps things going. We don't know the direction these social networks are moving in. Indeed. We're making plans behind the scenes to remain independent. Along the way, we require your help, and we thank you for your help, even your attention just watching this. To get to the show, my brother. Yes, indeed. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about ESPN. There's a host on ESPN, uh, Jamel Hill. She's an ESPN hank anchor. She's an 11-year vet. She's been doing this for quite some time, and she has indeed. a show on ESPN. She recently went on Twitter and went on a little rant about Donald Trump that I want to Ask you some ask you some questions about my brother. Uh, yes. In her Twitter, on her Twitter feed, she writes, Trump is the most ignorant, offensive president of my lifetime. His rise is Facts. a direct result of white supremacy, period. Facts. He is unqualified and unfit to be president. He is Facts. not a leader, and if he were not white, he would have never been elected. Facts. Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. Facts. The height of white privilege is being able to ignore his white supremacy because it's of no threat to you. Well, yes. it's a threat to me. So she recently said that, and um, yeah, it, it ignited a lot of controversy. Even the White House new press secretary said that those are fireable comments, uh, meaning that, you know, she should be fired. Um, they brought up Kurt Schilling, who was fired, I believe it was uh, two years ago. Uh, or last year, he was a former all-star pitcher turned baseball analyst, and he got involved in the restroom controversy when they wanted to let transgenders uh, use the same ba the bathroom of their choice. This was the North Carolina uh, transgender bathroom uh, law. And he said a man is a man no matter what they call themselves. Um, Facts. And he got in trouble for it. He got fired for it. So... Are we looking at a double standard here, Blue? Are we looking at a double standard where when white people tell the truth, because of their history, they don't have that much room to speak truth, but black people, there's more room because we have been the victims for so many years? Is this a double I mean, standard? what Church Schilling spoke on, you know, it definitely hit a nerve in regards to there are certain quote unquote groups in this country that are off limit from any commentary, you know what I'm saying, whatsoever. And he just so happened to cross that line. So he spoke about something that was politically insensitive, you know, during a time, I believe, um, I think Obama was still in the seat, you know what I'm saying? So that was a no go. I don't know if that would be the same right now under Trump's presidency. You know what I'm saying? Because Trump has made uh, many moves himself to alienate that community and not make the same overtures that Obama was making. You know what I'm saying? So they're not as politically protected, per se. So we're talking about timing. You know what I'm saying? He said, 
quote unquote the wrong thing at the wrong time and he paid the consequence for it because of the way that the political spectrum of the country was now the political spectrum is a little bit different so the sister says something right that if they were to poll the country maybe the majority of americans would agree with you know so is it what she said or is it the fact that she said it and she's a commentator and, you know, in order to have these positions in corporate America, they also own your voice. You know what I'm saying? So she doesn't have a right to express herself as a person. Her being a person comes second to her being a commentator. And her being a commentator is we're going to give you a sheet and you say what you need to say and what is um, within the guidelines of what we are proving. You know, even if we're paying you for your opinion, your opinion is only relegated to sports. Yeah, sports. Men pushing, put, you know, throwing footballs and catching them. You know what I'm saying? Other people sliding in and, and some, some other Negroes shooting basketballs. You know what I'm saying? And every now and then some people, you know, uh, doing hockey putts and golf and what have you. But anything outside of that, you know, we don't need to hear what your thoughts are. You need to sit down. Ironically, let's talk about double standards. But the quote unquote president of the United States has the highest dignified office in the country. Okay? But does he not use Twitter for rants? So, if he can use Twitter for rants, shouldn't it be shouldn't it be, you know, a fair playing field for somebody that wants to comment? on the things that no one else is willing to say she has to come out of her comfort zone and say these things on the same medium and the same platform that he uses to criticize people from time memorial i don't see what's wrong with that blue but if l l let's say the average person doesn't go to their job talking conscious the average person whether they're a teacher whether they work for a law firm whether they work for the medical industry, whatever industry they work for, they stay within that realm of, of whatever they're, they're, they're doing, whatever they're working for. Why do you think people want, like when you, when you begin to make more money when you're on TV, they look at you to be more uh, politically astute. They look at you to have more social commentary, but the average person isn't doing that on their job. Do you think that's unfair? of the people to ask somebody on TV to say something that they know damn well they're not going to say on their job? Is that unfair? Like I said, she had to come out of her comfort zone because these things are not being said by other people who may have the quote-unquote freedom to say them. You know what I'm saying? But she has the platform, she has the stage, and she has the voice where if she says something, it sounds like she says something because she couldn't sit on it any longer. It was heavy on her chest. So she had right. to speak. So it's her sanity as a person more important than her position, right? With making people feel safe and secure to say, look, um, we're only paying you for your opinion, right? Even though she's designated as being a very opinionated person because she's being paid for her opinion, right? But these are the parameters that your opinion can exist in. It can't spill over into any commentary right, that's right. dealing with society. And ESPN is already, uh, uh, you know, a platform disembroiled and engaged in social commentary. You understand? So it's not necessarily left field for her to be in a space that her company is already in. You dig what I'm saying? So we know what this is at the end of the day. This is all harking back to you niggas supposed to know your place, all right? You've been privileged to get a check and work in our corporation. You need to sit down and be quiet and speak only when spoken to, all right? And you a woman? So that's what this is about for real. You feel me? Okay? So the president can say that, you know, like how many women has he disrespected on his ascension to the uh, most dignified office in the country? You understand? From sports commentators to news commentators to his political opponents. You understand? Right? They're all pieces of meat. You dig what I'm saying? 
if I just read a comment, matter of fact, while we were preparing for the story where Floyd Mayweather said, look, Trump saying grab women by the pussy was just how real men talk. Right. Then Dow Strawberry said Trump is a great man. Well, why does it seem, it seems as though whenever one celebrity does something to try to wake the pe the masses up, another celebrity counters that. Is this, uh, do they, does the TV does this purposely or is this this opportunity for the individual to get attention? Because this, it happens every time. I mean, you know, these are the benefits with having a Negro front line. You know what I'm saying? Your Negro front line shows up to absorb particular blows to make sure, you know, that the opposition never gets to you. You feel me? So you neutralize that woman with these comments. And, you know, I always got a token in my back pocket that I'm going to throw at y'all when you criticize me to say I'm this, that, and the other. Now, even what she was talking about, Even if it doesn't pertain to Trump's history as a quote-unquote great man for the last 77 years of his life, she could just be talking about the last, what is it, six months of his presidency? Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And we can weigh that and gauge that for exactly what it is. Daryl Strawberry needs to sit his ass down, all right? Indeed. What, what, what would be your... Uh what would be your take or your, your your advice to people on their everyday job? Like we talked about people who have regular nine to fives. Because people usually hide their wokeness or hide their consciousness on the job. Should they should the average person be more look, outspoken look. on their job, Blue? We're at a place where we're not even talking about consciousness or wokeness. We're talking about, you know, regular social commentary. If you have been in the audience for the last six months, you don't even got to know anything, any of the backstory, to have some sort of commentary, to have some sort of opinion about a very opinionated president who got an opinion about everything. All right? These are not press releases. I told you before he got in that seat that he was going to preside off of Twitter. All right? And that's exactly what he's done. So, but for the people... All right, because there are members of this particular viewing audience, and there's definitely people on Twitter, especially on Twitter, who have corporate, uh, you know, they have corporate jobs, and they have to find out how to tread that very thin line between your corporate obligations, right? And these jobs often do come with guidelines. They often do come with some sort of... Um, you know, pre, pre, prerequisite way that you're supposed to behave because you represent as an employee of that corporation, you represent the corporation, right? You're part of their corporate holdings. You know what I'm saying? You're an employee. So, you know, based on your individual um, arrangement with this particular corporation, I would say that you have to figure out and find out what your elbow room is. You know what I'm saying? If you value that position enough to say, look, these people, right, majority of what chances are the bosses of these corporations, chances are, let's say six out of ten, if not seven out of ten, chances are they're either Republicans or they're heavy Republican donators. You know what I'm saying? So chances are, once again, even if they don't agree with Trump's politics, they're going to take offense to their employees having something to say on Twitter about Trump's politics. Because you know what will happen? Trump is on Twitter, and he'll attack them on Twitter and put that company into the highlight. And that, the, the, the CEOs of the corporations don't want that bad light. Because what did I tell you before? He's the king of trolling. He's the king of trolling. So he could cause problems for a company that a company might want to avoid dealing with the bad publicity because he uses that platform as his bully pulpit. He uses the office of presidency as his bully pulpit. You feel me? So nobody wants to squabble with this dude because he's unsquabbable. You know what I mean? He's willing to get in the mud pen with you and get filthy. And that's bad for the bottom line of any company with shareholders. So they don't want to be involved in that. So they're telling their employees, look, 
keep your personal beliefs and feelings and opinions out of the public spectrum. But that's what Twitter's for. That's what that, plat that, that platform is there for that. So you have to figure that thin line out. You have to figure that balancing out act. That balancing act out. Okay? If you want to walk that thin line, you know what I'm saying, and not end up in the, uh, in, in, in the crosshairs. Do you think that, you know, when we're talking about knowing how to maneuver in a capitalistic society uh, to benefit yourself, to benefit your family, um, do you think sometimes our culture, our people get too emotional and our emotions hurt us because somebody can hate your guts, blue pill, work with you, smile at you every single day, go to lunch with you and be fine, but for some reason... Our people have to let somebody know when they don't like them or they, they can't maintain that fake smile too much. You know, is that a problem living in this culture or that's just who we are? We're more of an authentic people, so it's hard for us to be phony in Hollywood or to be phony on the in the corporate world. Is that is that a good or a bad trait at this point? Don't say phony in Hollywood because them Hollywood folk, they got it down to a science. Okay? The thing that gets the Hollywood people is you know the backstabbing and and you know what I'm saying the gossiping and things of that nature but they damn sure know how to be fake in Hollywood trust that you know but yeah it's a um it's a gift and a curse for us you know the authenticity that we represent as a people is what people in the world love us for it's what they know us for and what they love us for but being under this particular occupation right when you're on your plantation i.e your corporate setting, your corporate job, you know, does your personal feelings or your personal beliefs have any play in that particular interaction? You know what I'm saying? When you're getting a paycheck for your time and energy and you're not getting paid for your opinion. You understand? Or how you feel. They could give two how you feel. Honestly, you know? But... I'm not about to sit here or stand here and tell you to suppress your natural voice because at the end of the day, all right, even what you're talking about or we spoke about in the other video about this new quote unquote time and age that we live in, you know what I'm saying, and spirituality and the uprising of spirituality in a person's being, you understand? You have to, you know. If we want to speak about it in a symbolic spiritual sense, it's about you opening your heart chakra, okay? But then next is your throat chakra. In order for you to get to your third eye, for you to get to your crown. So if you're closing your throat chakra, if you're suppressing your throat chakra for a check, you're going to leave that situation more jacked up and all of the proceeds that you were able to incur from that job is going to have to go to your psychological repairing that you're going to do afterwards because you're not going to be who you were sent to this planet to be at the end of the day. So yes, the universe wants to hear your voice. Yes, that sister, again, like I said, she represents the feminine aspect of Mother Nature. What? She's lashing out. She's lashing out. She got something to say, okay? Mother Nature, she insists on being heard through weather patterns, through a regular weather patterns and things of that nature, right? The melanated woman, she's going to lash out. You know what I'm saying? She's going to lash out in ways in which are very uncontrollable. Okay? She's a force of nature. And that's what that sister did. She shook things up. Blue, for those who um, call their corporate jobs, you know, you hear all the time brothers and sisters say, yeah, I got to. I got to go to the plantation or I don't get out to the plantation till five or six or whatever time they get off. Is that disrespect to the to the people who were really on the plantation? Is that, a, I mean, a total disregard of what they really went through back in the day? Because if somebody went got in a time machine from 1492 and, and jumped out the time machine in 2017, they might look at somebody like they crazy for calling that a plantation. And they come home with 500000 a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, there's a level of disrespect. And if I, if I offended anybody by um, even me using that particular reference, I do apologize. But, yes, there are people that um, 
identify it as such, you know what I'm saying? Because of the level of discomfort, the level of suppression, you know, when they factor in that quote unquote slaves may have had living quarters and they may have had, you know, food, even if it was scrappings. At the end of the day, when they finish with their paycheck, they're only able to pay for food and where they live. So they're like, minus master coming in the crib to rape me at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? They still calling you what you want, whatever they want. You feel me? You're still third and fourth class citizens, you know? So condition wise, yes, it might not be the same thing. All right. And that might, might not be the same thing as chattel slavery. All right. But there's an aspect of the suppression of one's liberated self that they experience when they're in a corporate setting that they feel is not too much different. OK, if slave master put a suit on and said, look, I'm going to get with this space age slavery. All right. We have to remove the whips and the chains and we could do this a whole nother way. All right. That might be what it is that they're looking at. They're identifying to say, look, this dude has an energy and an attitude about him that is very similar to his forefathers and his foreparents that never left him. It ain't get whooped out of him. Right. He ain't exercised none of his demons. So where did it go? So you put him in that position of quote unquote power. He's going to abuse the power and he's going to treat his workers and his underlings, you know, like subordinates. Got one more question for you, Blue. Yes, indeed. I often hear people of our generation, generation under us, uh, say that, yo, yo, we ain't going to be like, we ain't going to be like that, that civil rights generation. We ain't going to turn the other cheek. We ain't going we we ain't going to be weak. We ain't going to let them do to us what they did to them. I want but I want to read you something real quick, Blue. Yeah. Somebody uh I don't know if I got this from your Instagram or somebody. I think this was your Instagram. It says our grandparents, the same ones that get criticized for, you know, whatever during the civil rights era, had more heart. They said F that bus for 381 days. Ninjas could not, couldn't make it through preseason football. And of course, they're referring to Colin Kaepernick, pro, uh, um, you know, I stand with Ka Kaepernick. Everybody said, yeah, I stand with Kaepernick. Preseason came, they turned that TV right back on. It's a wrap. Wh what is it about our, our generation? Because we, for some reason, we're looking at them like they're soft. They did things that, man, we, we could be like, yeah, we, in our minds, we're like, yo, we'll never do that. We're not going to boycott one Christmas. We're not going to boycott Thanksgiving for one year. What is the difference between them and us, brother, and why they were able to do something 381 days without public transportation, brother? I got a lot of comments on that post. It was shared multiple times, so I'll share with you some of the things that were shared with me, you know, because I put a post up like that for shock value, you know, with a, with a, a caption that gets people to comment because I want to see what's on people's minds. I definitely didn't want to attack nobody for even falling back into the NFL. What did I say? I said Negroes will put down Buffalo Wings and Jesus before they put down NFL, which is their new religion. All right? Our ancestors, and I ain't talking spooky, I'm talking about the ancestors from a generation of one or two ago in the 50s and the 60s, right? Nan and them, you know? What was the glue that held them together? They had a level of cohesiveness because they didn't have media as a distraction, first of all. You know what I'm saying? Um, they had a sense of purpose being that, you know, they still felt that they were going through a level of upward mobility together. I think they had a clear identified adversary knowing even if they embraced this person's culture, they knew that that person themselves had no good intent for them. You know what I'm saying? Even if Nana was at their house scrubbing and she loved little Dolly, you know what I'm saying? And she did everything that she could for her, you know, that was just her heart. You feel me? And that's who we are as a people. But at the same time, I know as a collective, you know, the experience was very real 
and it was still ripe in their minds. So they had the ability to try something new as well, right? They were creating a template and not working off one. You dig what I'm saying? So, you know, and we had innovators amongst us to say, look, you know, while they were boycotting, we started some of our own Jitney services. You had people that were able to get up. And let's also not exclude the fact that they had the black church as a glue. All right. Let's not exclude that because during times like this, when we're talking about the struggles of our people and how they banded together and how they stuck together and how they were successful, the majority of those things could be attributed to two things. Right. In different eras, this one not in particular, the black church and black radio. And this was taught to me by Dick Gregory, Bob Dick Gregory uh -huh. and Bob Hope. I mean, Bob Law. <laughs> my bad. They're going to cut me up. In the <laughs> Bob Hope. <laughs> we forgive you, brother. We forgive you. I already know it. Bob Law and Bob Dick Gregory. The black church and black radio. Okay. They were used as the glue in our community to bring people to organize and to keep them together on one accord. You know what I'm saying? Black church had quote unquote leaders coming out of those churches, whether they was the reverends or the preachers or what have you, they was with the shits. So if that is considered your, your leaders in the community and they're telling you, look, we're going to stick together and we're going to do this thing. You feel me? Endure, endure the extra miles that you have to walk. Cause it's not just enough to say, yo, they didn't get on the bus. Some of them had to walk instead of riding the bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? Yeah. But we had that in us. That's why I don't know what the problem is today. If your nana had it in you, where the hell is it in you? How could it be removed from one or two generations? I don't get that. I don't get that. I don't know what sort of etherical surgery that they did on niggas to remove that gene. You feel me? I don't know what sort of gene splicing took place in them operation rooms for them to take that gene out of you that you knew how to endure and buckle down. You know what I'm saying? But we're too comfortable. We don't have no level of cohesiveness. We have let go of the concept of liberation because it wasn't a plan or an idea that was properly sold to us. It has to be reformatted, repackaged, and resold generation after generation. You feel me? So King, he jugged for civil rights he jugged for his dream once the people got the dream then what else was there to jug for you understand what else was there to jug for then they started sinking in like butter on toast you feel me and that's when assimilation started happening and things of that nature so where are we at the end of the day you know what i'm saying so my whole thing again the cohesiveness comes with a collective plan we're doing this to get where to do what? Hmm? To get Kaepernick back on the field? To start our own league? You understand? What is, what, what is, again, what is being provided to fill the gap of four or five hours on a Sunday for these melanated men? Who grew up playing football? Whose children are playing football? You know what I'm saying? Or who just really enjoy watching men in tights? What is put in place to replace that addiction that they have? Because we live in an addictive society. So how are you going to break that addiction, right? You got to replace one form of dope with the other. You understand? It's cute. I felt that it was very cute, you know. But we don't know our people. We obviously don't. If you think niggas is going to put down football, you crazy. Leave your contact info, my brother, so the people could get at you. At Blue Pillar 44, okay? Roll back. All right? Apparelnormal.com. Mypowerpieces.com. Ocean14Corp.com. Help me out, y'all. I don't want to go back into that plantation and that corporation. <laughs> Peace, family. Hey. We was about to wrap up the video, but uh, we was in Brooklyn. This brother just ran up on us. He said he was just finished watching Blue That's Pills' right. video. We I in Bushwick. We found a Bushwick native. 
I'm from who? Queens, though. Okay. I'm from Queens. I'm from Queens. Uh, my man live out here, Best Style, and uh, dropping always just came out the studio and. Plug, plug your, plug your, uh, your project, oh, brother. Oh yeah, definitely. You got two projects: Manufactured Insanity, and I got the other one, a Guerrilla Warfare. We talk about all that corporate greed. Uh, peace. peace, peace. Have a good one. You can check me out, JohnFigs.com, uh, SoundCloud as well. John Figs, you can type it in, Google me, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and um, yeah. Matter of fact, I was watching um, yeah, this is the Guerrilla Warfare, and then Manufacturing Insanity. So we talk about corporate greed and all that, and uh, yeah, man, definitely, definitely. I was actually watching um, he was uh, interviewing Professor Griff off the storm. Yeah, he got, he, was, uh, he got stuck with no lights. With no yeah, he light. got caught he up. Yeah. Garage, he was like, yo, I'm pitch black here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just listening to that joint. All right, well, Great. we appreciate you stopping by. Any other contact info you want to leave? Oh, that's, that's it right there. Yeah, yeah, everything. Instagram, uh, Twitter, <clears throat> at johnfix.com, too. You can check all my videos and uh, and all the projects, man. Definitely. All right, thanks, thanks for the support, brother. No doubt, always. Peace, family. All right, all right, all right peace. Well.